Hey, everybody, this is Evan Lazar and Alex Barth in 98.5 on the Patriots Beat podcast, talking quarterbacks. We're going to talk a little bit about free agent wide receiver targets as well, Alex. But I wanted to pass catchers, pass catchers, pass Not catchers, just receivers, pass that's, catchers. That, that's a good point. We're, we're talking about pass. There's catchers. a little tease right there. <laughs> uh, we saw today, earlier today, Daniel Jeremiah, he released his second mock draft and had the Patriots taking J.C. Horn from South Carolina, a cornerback, and uh, that made a lot of people unhappy. I think everybody in Patriot Nation is really 100% focused, I would say, on quarterbacks and pass catchers, as, as you yeah. like to call them. And uh, there was a really interesting report that we wanted to discuss here on the pod today from ESPN's Mike Reese, which came out yesterday, saying that the Patriots would like to move on a quarterback sooner rather than later. And, and basically that the timing of the move to attract free agents is important to them. And, and I think that that's a really interesting yeah. point. Basically what Reese is saying is that they would prefer – a veteran quarterback that they can bring into the building to make other free agents want to come here. Other free agent pass catchers want to come here. I guess we can start with this in a lot of different directions, but I think the main place that we can start, and I have also heard some rumblings that the Patriots are not necessarily looking quarterback in the first round either. I think that's the most interesting part about the report is that given that he said, Reese said that timing was so important to them. That kind of doesn't sound like a Mac Jones or a quarterback trade up or something like that is necessarily what they're thinking about right now, at least. So I don't think it rules out a quarterback in the first round. And I wrote about this yesterday, and you can check it out on 985thesportsub.com or on my, uh, uh, find it on my Twitter at Real Alex Barth. It doesn't, it, it rules out a quarterback, a rookie quarterback starting week one. Yeah. That's what we've ruled out. That a starter is going to come in at some point today's what February 16th. So at some point in the next 29 days, a, a, a starter is going to be brought in here, a veteran starter, whether it's Cam Newton, whether it's Marcus Mariota, who I'm now calling the Providence Place Mall because of his contract escalator, whether it's Derek Carr, whether it's Carson Wentz, it won't be. But like you get what I'm saying. One of those guys or mystery name is going to Jimmy is going to be brought in between now and March 17th. That guy will be the presumptive starter going into camp and likely will start week one. Now, this doesn't rule out a first-round quarterback altogether because you can still draft a guy and, and maybe the guy they bring in is the bridge. I think people are looking a little too heavily at the, the line about, you know, if they want to recruit a receiver or tight end that they can show them who's throwing them the ball. I don't think have I don't think the specific quarterback is the recruiting push. Because unless you bring back Cam, who guys like Odell want to play with, none of the quarterbacks you're going to get, maybe Corey Davis and Mariota, maybe, but none of them are really recruiting pieces. The goal, is how I interpret this, is just to say, we have a quarterback. There is right. stability here. We're not waiting until July again. So I'm not ruling out a rookie. And the other reason I'm not is as I go back and look at Reese's report, so this is what he says after that, because... Mike Greenberg, who he was on with, asks him this question about, you know, well, that's before the draft and it won't be a rookie. So Reese says, and he, he, he mentions that they were at Clemson's Pro Day, which the Patriots were. And there were only two players working out, right? Uh, Etienne didn't work out. Uh, uh, Mari Rogers didn't work out. It was Trevor Lawrence and a fifth round receiver, uh, Cornell Powell, who I don't know how much they'd be interested in. So here's what Reese says about them being at, at Clemson's Pro Day. Now, they're not going to get Trevor Lawrence. But here's why that stood out to me. It tells me they are all in on the draft quarterbacks. Reese then mentions that in 2012, the Patriots didn't scout luck because, quote, Belichick knew it wasn't realistic. So are they scouting Trevor Lawrence to trade up for Trevor Lawrence? No. But if you're going to trade up or trade down, it is important to, and this is really complex, so I'll just kind of give the cliff notes. It's important to understand not just all the different quarterbacks, but the disparity. Just because you're not going to trade up for Trevor Lawrence, knowing the gap between Lawrence and Fields, between Lawrence and Wilson, between Lawrence and Lance, knowing how big that gap is, is important. So even if you're not going to draft Trevor Lawrence and you know you're not going to draft Trevor Lawrence, if you want to make a play on a first round quarterback, especially if you plan on doing it via trade, there is inherent value in scouting Trevor Lawrence and getting that up close look at him. Yeah. So I'm to sum this whole thing up. Cause I've noticed some people on YouTube telling me to be more concise. This report rules out. It, it, it rules out the quarterback starting week one, a rookie quarterback starting week one. 
I am not ready to say it rules out a quarterback with a premium pick. It lessens the odds, but it certainly doesn't rule it out. Yeah, I would agree with everything that you said. And I think the big thing that came from this report was that they do want to show some that they have a more united front, more, some more stability at that position. And they don't want to go, like you said, into July without a quarterback because that – we saw what it was last year. We saw how difficult it was, not only for the player and Cam Newton to get up to speed and get ready for the season with the Patriots, but also we know that if they're kind of sitting there and they have Stidham on the roster and they don't really have a quarterback going into the draft weekend, no free agent's going to want to sign here with that being the plan, with it being so up in the air. So they do want some stability at that spot. And to me, that really doesn't speak to it we're going to talk about some of the guys that maybe they could they could pull in before free agency really gets underway but to me that speaks to cam newton again which is something that reese said last week as well we talked about it last week Uh, you know i reported the door is not closed on cam newton reese kind of said something similar then he comes this week and says they want to get this done early in free agency to start attracting free agents i'm not necessarily saying cam newton attracts free agents but there's some stability there at the position it was a guy that they had here last year and i think the other thing that uh, which is a big element for it uh, to me with the draft is that it doesn't rule out the fact that maybe they don't Mac Jones to me is the type of guy, for instance, that is pretty pro ready, right? He's been at Alabama. He's played, started there for almost a two, two full seasons. He has all the polish. He has all the things in the pocket that you look for at the quarterback that he just has athleticism and sort of just overall ceiling concerns at the NFL level, right? Is he right. a Derek Carr? Is he a Kirk cousins or can he elevate his game to like Matt Ryan type status? That, that's sort of the concern with him, whereas maybe if they do have a Cam Newton in the building, and I'm just using Cam as an example, as a placeholder, a Trey Lance conversation can be had, right, where you take the guy that has a little bit more upside, a little bit more athleticism, and you know, okay, we don't need this guy to start year one, week one, whatever the case may be. We can let him sit behind a veteran quarterback for at least, even his entire rookie season. You know, maybe they do look at this – and they say, okay, we can go about this in a situation where we're going to take a little bit of a chance on a guy with some high upside that doesn't necessarily have the floor that a guy like a Mac Jones has, but he has a higher ceiling potentially, and kind of do what the Chiefs did with Patrick Mahomes, right? We have our veteran quarterback with Alex Smith in this version. Maybe it's Cam Newton. Maybe it's Jimmy G if he gets released or something like that, and we go from there. But the one thing that I think that this does sort of rule out to me is giving up any sort of serious – capital and cap space to a quarterback position. Now, I think that there are some as part of the Reese report was that and I think I'm trying to remember what he said verbatim. This quote I don't have in front of me, but something along the lines of they're open to free agency draft or trade and they feel comfortable if the right guy becomes available that they have the cap space and I thought that that was really telling the right guy comes available. I think that if they can get for instance, we talked about it on the pod a couple of times, Dak Prescott, right? If, you, if you're if you in the conversation for Dak Prescott, I think we're having a different discussion, right? But I, to me, I don't see, based off of this, that they want a guy that's kind of established that can kind of come in here and give some stability to that position. And then maybe they can look to the draft in a different sort of way than maybe we have been thinking about it. I, that doesn't scream Marcus Mariota to me, right? That doesn't scream... Right. A Jimmy G on his current deal to me and giving up, let's say they have to give up a third round pick to get Jimmy G back or a third or a fourth round pick to get Marcus Mariota in here or, you know, something along those lines. That report doesn't suggest to me that they are going to overextend for a quarterback in the veteran market unless they know that it's a guy like Dak who they're guaranteeing they're getting somebody really, really good, right? Like, well, but then who does it, but, but what you just described outside of Dak. That's all that that's all the veterans. Right. So then that so then it's just Cam. So you're saying right. Cam's coming back. I, I I still think Cam is coming back. I still think that's the most likely scenario that we're well, going to worth. She already had this morning. He said 35 to 40 percent chance Cam comes back. I, I agree with that because you never know what door might open, right? You know, you never know right. what, what what might happen and what door might open. So I don't well, think are they just do you think they're just waiting on on a guy, whether it's Dak or or, or whoever? To, to like once that guy's off the table, then it then Cam comes back? I, I think so. I think that Cam is their plan B and has been their plan B now for two years, right? And, right. and I, I think that that's really their plan. I think plan A would be to 
to hit a home run and get somebody like Dak Prescott. I, I don't think that's going to happen. And I think that we can all kind of imagine that that's a very low possibility. I think plan one B is Jimmy Garoppolo, but I don't think that they want to pay Jimmy Garoppolo $25 million next year. Now you can get him in the building after you trade him and rework the contract and go down that entire route. But I do not think that they want to trade a third round pick for Jimmy Garoppolo and then pay him $25 million he- next year. I, I think they would, and I'm not saying I would, but I think they would because they always look at things in terms of, you know, return on investment and things like that. Couldn't you see Belichick? He got a second for Garoppolo, right? He got a second. He gets him back for a third. Can't you see Belichick seeing that as a win? I could see the trade being a win to Belichick, but could, I just don't imagine with Jimmy Garoppolo's history, his injury history, obviously what he has brought to the table as a starter in San Francisco is a really, when he's healthy, obviously you have to caveat everything you say about Jimmy Garoppolo with that. What he has brought is a really steady quarterback when things are not going well, when he's under pressure, when he's blitzed, he's been very, very good. And within 20 yards of the line of scrimmage, he's been an accurate passer. He had more interceptions last year than completions of over 20 yards on deep passes. Two INTs to only, he was one for 10 on deep passes last year when he played. So not a very good deep thrower and not a very good athlete, right? But he's got that quick, compact release. He's got that ability to get the ball out against pressure. So those are things that kind of save him in that category. But basically what I'm getting at is that Jimmy Garoppolo, to me, if they're going to evaluate him on a scale, right, Jimmy Garoppolo is not a $25 million a year player right now. He's just not. So, if but, you're, he, but he is, he, they might not think he is, but that's the, unless he gets cut, that's what he is. And I think that there's, this is what surprised me about the release report saying that they want to do whatever veteran move they make. They want to get it done as early as possible is I don't think that Jimmy G is, if he is going to get released, I don't think it's going to happen until after the draft. Right. Because I I don't see San Francisco having an immediate upgrade unless Deshaun Watson becomes available. I don't see them being able to make that move quickly enough in order to move on from Jimmy early on in free agency. So to me, it feels like a a pre June one cut because I know he's got some guaranteed money on his deal post June one. It feels like it would be right after the draft or during the draft that maybe they, they can make a trade happen or something like that on draft weekend. But to me, and again, they can rework the deal a little bit once he gets here, but I just don't see them giving up a pick and then paying Jimmy Garoppolo $25 million next year. If he gets cut and they can get him back on a Marcus Mariota type contract, right? Where it's like two years, 10 million, you know, escalators if he starts games and stuff like that. That's a different conversation. But I think what you're working with now is what's the what's the veteran quarterback that you want to have for 2021 and then maybe i i do agree that they might look at the draft still for a quarterback early but i think it's going to be somebody like a trey lance that has some upside to him not necessarily a mac jones who's just kind of you know what you're sort of getting with that player no if that's the plan and again i'm somebody who's pounded the table for mac jones over trey lance because i'm floor 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 but if this is the plan then yeah, Trey Lance absolutely should be the guy. You get a veteran in here on a two-year deal. You let Lance sit for a year, and then you know, however much of the way into year two, you kind of make that transition. So we'll see how yeah, that plays is, out. And if Trey Lance, I'm just we're just spitballing here, right? But if Trey Lance is their guy, then Cam Newton makes a whole lot of sense yeah. as a veteran quarterback. That's but like again, probably the one scenario where it actually you can sell it is you have Cam, who is the ultimate dual threat quarterback, you know, in terms of his career arc, right? Not necessarily right right now, but in terms of where he's been teaching Trey Lance, who's probably maybe besides Justin Fields, if you want to call him a dual threat, probably the best dual threat in the draft, right? So the problem with that becomes, and I don't disagree with anything you said, and we've talked about this before. Do you have faith in Bill Belichick being able to bench Cam Newton when the time comes and make the quarterback switch. Cause I don't. Because so I maybe, I've maybe seen he have to that, that he will do that. Maybe he doesn't have to make that decision. Maybe he feels like he's going to tell Trey Lance, Hey, look, you're red shirting your rookie year. You're learning, you're holding the clipboard. You're learning from Cam. You're learning from the coaches, you know, a Patrick Mahomes type of situation. Right. Okay, Where and you're you're not year starting two. Year two. What about year two? Like, is he just going to stick on Cam until Cam retires? Is he if he re-signs Cam Newton, if he brings back Cam Newton, that's an extension 
of all the issues of not benching him last year. It's just another example of Bill Belichick not being able to quit Cam Newton. And I get he doesn't quit him until he quits him, right? It's a one-time thing. Once he gives up, he gives up. But if he brings Cam Newton back, that's just Bill can't quit this guy. And if he's willing to pay him, and we'll see what the contract is. If it's $750,000, again, I'll, I won't feel as strongly about it. But if they give Cam Newton $10 million, like a two-year $20 million contract, which I don't think is unrealistic, then I'm going to – Trey Lance is going to sit on the bench forever. He's going to gather cobwebs because I just have no faith that Belichick can quit Cam Newton. He had yeah. every opportunity. He had every chance to. And I know maybe Stidham didn't look good. And we talked about that last week. But it got to the point where Stidham became irrelevant. You needed to make a quarterback change just to give the team a kick in the ass. That's what it came down to. And he still could do it. It's difficult. The only player – and I understand that we – as fans, as media, don't necessarily think highly of Cam Newton, but in the NFL, in the league, players love Cam Newton and they gravitate towards him. He's a lot of these young players, like an Odell, for example, Cam Newton is their hero, right? Like he he is the one of the guys in the league. That's an, a more attractive veteran option, I would say, for a lot of people than Jimmy Garoppolo or Marcus Mariota or even even a guy like a Derek Carr, who I don't think is going to be available necessarily. I still think guys are more inclined to want to play and want to come here. If you're truly, like Reese said, truly trying to attract free agents with whatever move you make at quarterback, who's going to attract more free agents here, Mariota or Cam Newton? I, I still no, think it's, it's, it's Cam, Cam, I agree. Right. It's you're still, but even in that scenario, you're still handcuffing yourself to Cam. Are you going to have, if, if these guys all come to play with Cam and he comes out and throws two touchdowns and 10 picks in the first seven weeks, are you going to be able to make the switch? Or is that going to be a locker room problem? Like I just, I don't, it's not so much that I'm against the idea of Cam Newton coming back. I'm, I'm against the idea of Cam Newton coming back and him being sharpied into the starter role for another 16 games. Sure. I want him, like, if he's back, I'd like to know that there's some flexibility, that the leash is short, that the hook is waiting, that if things go south again, we don't have to watch that kind of quarterback play for 16 weeks again. And I, there's just nothing I've seen and just common sense and history don't tell me that things will be any different if he comes back. Everything you see, everything you hear, everything we've been through, it just feels like if he comes back, we're just hitting reset. And it's going to be another year where we get to November and Cam's struggling and they're, I don't know, four and six. And everybody's calling Cam to be benched and we get snarky comments from Belichick about why it won't happen. Like, I just can't but, but, help but see that playing out again. Well, the reason why it wouldn't play out is if they upgrade at a receiver and tight end significantly at least one guy comes in here to play with cam and, and it's a better situation, whether or not, I think cam can completely turn around his career at this point. I don't necessarily, but I do think that he can play better than he did last year. If he's throwing to Odell or he's throwing Allen Robinson, or he's throwing a Corey Davis and Curtis Samuel versus throwing to what he was throwing to a year ago. So I think there is some element. But is that going to make enough of a difference? I think there's certainly some room for improvement though, right? I mean, at the very least, I don't look and PFF came out with their stats yesterday, their 2021 QB annual. Yeah. I sent you the chart and it's ugly, right? Cam Newton in terms of perfect ball placement, what they call accuracy plus was 32nd out of 32 qualified quarterbacks. He was 24 out of 32, just an overall general accuracy percentage. And this is actual ball placement they're studying here. This isn't just completion percentage or adjusted completion percentage. This is them going and watching the tape and studying where the ball is actually flying and where the defenders are relative to the ball. And he was one of the least accurate quarterbacks in the NFL. He also threw one of the highest percentage of throws into tighter closing coverage, right? Into very, very tight windows. And this was a similar, very different sort of, you know, situation, but last year in 2020, uh, excuse me, 2019, their QB annual was similarly harsh on Tom Brady, right? Where his numbers, his accuracy numbers, his metrics in terms of throwing uh, into accuracy pluses and stuff like that was not as normally good as we are used to seeing with Tom Brady this year with the pucks and Mike Evans and Chris Godwin and Gronk back and all these things, he was a top five accurate passer in the league again. Right. So I'm not saying he, Cam's going to have that sort of split, but 
what we are seeing, and especially when we look at the advanced metrics in terms of accuracy, what we are seeing is that it is heavily, heavily influenced on supporting cast, right? If you get a quarterback as a poor supporting cast and you get them better weapons, almost all NFL quarterbacks, unless they completely have fallen off the cliff, which maybe Cam has, almost all NFL quarterbacks kind of regress back to the mean or, or improve back to the mean a little but bit. That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense to me because accuracy should be independent of who you're throwing to. Shouldn't it? It's not because it's in terms of if you're throwing into really tight windows, getting the ball into those tight windows is difficult, right? So it's more. I'm not necessarily saying that the window itself, but you know, an open receiver is an open receiver, right? right? Yeah, and and maybe start, the better players get open more. They have a bigger catch radius, but. Right, but if such a low percentage of his throws are into those open receiver windows, and then you're you're using a much sm- a larger sample of tight window throws versus somebody like a Brady who might have a, lo- a larger window of open throws, right? Then it's going to hurt okay. how your pinpoint accuracy is going to factor in there. That that's that's a lot to to digest, I think, in terms of on a on a podcast trying to outline all the different metrics and stuff like that. But I think the main thing is is that Reese's report really kind of paints a picture of an aggressive Patriots opening up a free agency at the quarterback position Does in it? order to get some people here. Wait, wait, wait. Does it? We, we just both agree that the Reese report is basically just code for cams coming back. That's not aggressive. Well, I think that I mean, in terms of they're going to sign somebody sooner rather than later, as early as possible. So, so now the whole aggressive there. report, which I've been a fan of. So you think aggression just means timing. It just means we're going to make bad signings in March instead of making them in April. Well, I don't know if it, I guess it depends on what you consider a bad signing, but if that's the way that you want to look well, at here's it. Here's what I'm saying. Then yes. I, and, and I haven't been against how they've run free agency in the past, right? The waiting until day two, getting the value guys, but that all made sense because you had Brady. That game plans out the window. Now that free agency plan now would be bad. So What I'm saying is I assumed aggressive meant going for more elite, higher priced, higher talent options in free agency. You just think it means – So no, I'm legitimately asking you here. You think aggressive means the same kind of players, but they're just going to do it sooner? I think that aggressive – I think we have a different barometer versus the team in some respects of what is that elite type of player, what is that guy that they're willing to pay, and – as much as we might disagree with them on certain quarterbacks, I think that they view the, that position as a position that they still, unless they are going to get a Dak Prescott, unless they're going to get a Deshaun Watson, unless they're going to get an Aaron Rodgers, they still don't feel that it's in the best interest of the team to have a quarterback making $25 million a year. So that we just, you but, can put aggressive, but that, but that element of it, I think is a big factor because they could trade for Jimmy Garoppolo tomorrow probably honestly they, they they could make an offer to the Niners that the Niners would take tomorrow on Jimmy Garoppolo but I still think the hesitation there is going to be that 25 million dollar cap it- so I was gonna say like if 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 aggressive like aggressive and having budgetary constraints doesn't you can't marry those two concepts. I don't think they have budgetary constraints at other positions I think that they are going to pay out go out and pay a pass catcher whether it's acquiring that's them, and that, that's fine or, but or whatever if, if there's one position where you should be okay spending, it should be quarterback. I get Garoppolo. I don't want to pay a guy $25 million just to pay him. Garoppolo's not worth that. He's not talented. But aggressive to me means you're going to upgrade. Whether you upgrade elsewhere or not, right? Whether they get better receivers or not, the Patriots can upgrade a quarterback, yes or no? They can, certainly. So, so that's what I'm saying. Bringing Cam Newton back is not an upgrade. It's not aggressive. If their goal is we right. want to only Marcus spend Mariota, what we spend. Is Marcus Mariota an upgrade? Is is Marginally, but is he Ryan is. Patrick an upgrade? No. I, I guess what I'm saying, is, he might That's be. The problem I, that they're running into, though, is that they're, they don't have, unfortunately, they do not have the draft capital to make a trade for Deshaun Watson. They don't have it. If Deshaun Watson becomes available, then Miami and the Jets are going to put the number two and number three pick and their young quarterbacks in the trade. The Patriots can't come close to that, right? But then you have, but there's trickle down. I think Darnold would be an upgrade. I think Tua would be an upgrade. So you go right. get one of those guys. That then with those guys, you know the issue is that they're in the AFC East. And if, if the Dolphins or the Jets are going to trade one of those guys to the Patriots, then you're going to have to pay a premium for trading that player. That's if being aggressive to me. 
that's being aggressive. I if just you think want Sam Darnold, they have to end up taking trading the fifteenth pick. I, I would take that. I would take that. I I don't know that Darnold. Like I would Sam Darnold. I would take I. It, how much better? You know, what's the gap between Darnold and Jones? I would take Jones with the fifteenth pick. But Jones is on a four year rookie contract. Sam Darnold is is on the nearing the last year of his deal. You're but you're not going to have to. I don't think you're either. Either he balls out and he's great and you pay him and fine. You have a quarterback or he doesn't play well and and you 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 can sign him for less. I just think. If I, don't the plan, the I don't hate the swing on Sam Darnold. I'm just saying that I think that there's no, that, I, I, I get that AFC East premium on Darnold or Tua, and it's going to be difficult for the Patriots to make that trade because I, I'm not parting with 15 for maybe I part with 15 for Tua because of his contract. He's you know only in his second year, right? But in terms of Darnold, I, I'm not giving up the first round pick for Sam Darnold right now. I just think that. If if aggressive means we want to upgrade a quarterback, but we don't want to spend any more than we spent last year, that's just ludicrous. I don't think it's that they don't want to spend any more than they want, they spent last year. I just think that you have to look at the tiers of the quarterbacks and recognize that, okay, if we can get a Dak Prescott, if he somehow becomes available, and Jerry Jones, and we've talked about how dumb Jerry Jones is right. be in the past, if he's dumb enough to let Dak Prescott become available, granted, he's still going to tag Dak, Dak Prescott and force a trade, right? It's not no, gonna it's be, gonna be a trade, of course. But I guess I guess what I'm saying is if you're saying we're gonna be aggressive and and look for a bargain, you're not being aggressive. Like you can't be aggressive and look for a bargain. I, yes, I get I get what you're bargain. saying. I think they're looking, they always look for value, right? Always. But and that's not being aggressive, that's looking for value. Those are two yeah opposite maybe, concepts maybe, you can't do both of those at the same time maybe the aggressive approach we we sort of unless the aggressive is just timing unless it just means they're going to expedite they're going to keep the same thought process but just expedite it i just can't imagine and look i i think that there is a possibility and uh, when we talk about some of these pass catchers we can talk about it with these guys I think there's a very, very good possibility that Patriots are going to make a big splash move for an, a legitimate NFL pass catcher, whether it's a signing sure. a free agent or making a trade. Because over the last couple of years, and granted, they've come close but no cigar, but they have been the finalists for a lot of really big name pass catchers in the market, right? Stephon Diggs is kind of the biggest one, I would say. But even guy like Adam Humphreys, who we're going to discuss here in a second, he was somebody that they aggressively pursued in free agency a couple of years ago as well. They have tried to make moves for wideouts, whether they have all worked out or not is another story. So I think that what they're going to do and what they continue to want to do from what I can understand is keep that quarterback number as low as possible so that they can stack the rest of the roster. Now, when I first heard these that sort of philosophy, my initial instinct was to think that they were going to draft somebody at quarterback, right? You pay a rookie contract, right. then you can have all the cap space in the world. I, I, I think that they're hesitant to let a rookie start week one. So maybe the option is Cam at $8 million, a rookie quarterback in the draft, and then you spend all of the rest of that money on, on guys that can help the quarterback out. And eventually, you know, you kind of to settle on one of those quarterbacks or maybe you let cam start for 2021 and, and then you come back to the rookie in his second year ultimately though the aggressive sort of mindset i i don't think that it's necessary it's never going to be aggressive the way that us patriots fans and reporters want it to be right it's never going to be the patriots are not going to be one of those teams that just pays a price of four first round picks for deshaun watson I just can't right. imagine that they're ever going to be that team. And ultimately that's probably what it would take for them to win a bidding war against the Jets or the Dolphins with them be offering four first, four seconds, JC Jack, you know, throwing the entire kitchen sink at Deshaun. And I just don't think that Bill Belichick is ever going to be that type of manager. Yeah. I, I mean, you're right. But again, I, I think there's middle ground there. I, I, I don't think they're going to get Deshaun Watson and the, the no trade clause complicates that. But again, if you can, I mean, I thought Stafford and they, they ultimately couldn't have gotten him because although they, they could have because he didn't have a no trade clause. The whole not want to go to New England thing was stupid, but they we saw enough. that was the reason why they couldn't get Stafford. I know that sounds crazy, but the, the Lions ultimately had deals on the table where they had an established veteran quarterback in the package so that they didn't have to put all their eggs in a rookie's basket. Right. Right no, and, and I get that. But just in terms of the offer, right? It was Breer, I believe, who had this report. They offered a second round pick. Yeah. And that and was it. Yeah. So, I mean, if we look back, if we look at the mindset, that's not being aggressive. 
that is well, maybe, not maybe being aggressive. Harping a little bit too much on the aggressive part of it, you know. I'm sorry. Uh, that's what that's what got my hopes up for the whole off season. I saw that. I got excited. I think we got. I think we got sell the a, not a complete bag of goods because I think that they are going. Well, to make no, it, I, I I think it's it's the aggressive just refers to timing. I think that's it. Yeah. It just means they're going to expedite the process. They're going to have the same process. It's just going to happen quicker. All right, let's That's what I'm start starting to believe. Some of these pass catchers. All right, yeah. the one guy that I really wanted to talk about today was Curtis Samuel because I haven't necessarily done any videos or any deep dives into Curtis Samuel yet, so I thought this would be a good opportunity. I know you hate the nerds, Alex, but the nerds absolutely love Curtis Samuel. This is a guy that was first in the league last year in catch rate. He was sixth in separation per target, averaged three and a half yards per separation uh, of separation per target. I'm not the biggest next gen guy, but this is somebody that can definitely fly he's got good hands down the field he's got great versatility you can move him all around the formation in the backfield even and, and have him run routes like he's a running back coming out of the backfield you can play him in the slot you can play him on the outside on the boundary he can do a lot of things that i would say the patriots really liked in the past my issue with curtis samuel is that i don't think he can be the only guy that you bring in right because i i, I don't feel that curtis samuel is a true number one wide receiver Right. But right. He is one A to a one B. Then I I think that you're cooking a little bit, but he's a really nice player as a complimentary to a, a top dog. If he was, you know, paired with Stefan Diggs, for example, then you would have a really good receiving core. Well, this is, I mean, I talked about this in terms of free agency kind of, you know, when we laid out what our plans would be is that I'm not in on, on Allen Robinson in that if I'm going to spend $20 million right on wide receivers get me a guy for like 13 and seven, 15 and five, yeah. like go, go get me. Like they need, they're not one guy away. They're two or three guys away in terms of pass catchers, whether that's three receivers, two receivers in a tight end. I mean, you can mix and match three tight ends probably doesn't work, but you mix and match it together pretty much how you want to mix and match it. So Curtis Samuel to me, yeah, that's the kind of guy they should be going for. And I know I just went on that whole rant about be aggressive, go get the top guy, but that's at a position where really we're, not really only unless you're the saints and you're doing the Fakakta thing with, with Mr. BYU. Uh, uh, why am I blanking on his name? Taysom, Taysom Hill. Hill. Thank you. Yeah. Unless you're doing the Fakakta Taysom Hill bull crap. Only one guy plays quarterback at a time wide receiver, three or four guys are going to be on the field at a time. And they really only have two right now. And I'm not counting Edelman in that. I'm not sure what Edelman's situation is going to be, whether he's going to be on the team, whether he's going to be healthy I don't think you can bank. I love Edelman, but I don't think you can bank on him as a shirt thing at this point entering, you know, age 33 season. What is it? 13, I think for him. Yeah. So, like you know, I, you need multiple guys. Curtis Samuel's a guy, like you said, I think he can get him. He's going to cost you, but you're not going to completely wipe out your assets. And then you pair him with a guy like a Keenan Allen, like a Juju Smith Schuster, like one of those guys, you go get one of those one, a type free agent wide receivers. And now you're starting to build something a little bit. Yeah, I think we're in agreement with Curtis Samuel. He's suspected to get around ten, ten and a half million dollars on the open market. I think that if you come in at like aggressively, not to use that word again, but if you come in aggressively at like eleven, eleven and a half, then you might be able to outpay him in terms of the market and maybe the quarterback situation or, or coming to the Patriots in general, given the fact that it's not the most attractive destination right now. Maybe it doesn't matter if you're over a million. Or well, million the the money is what off. makes the Patriots an attractive free agent destination right. right now. Right. And I think Curtis Samuel at his age, I think he's about 25, 26 hitting that second contract. This is when those players in that second contract really want to cash in. Right. That's right. why we've talked about Curtis Samuel a lot. That's why we've talked about Corey Davis. Uh, th those types of players are juju. Th those are the types of guys that are looking to get paid right now. And if you come in aggressively at Curtis Samuel's market at the top of the market, then I think that you can have the opportunity to sign that player. And again, I really, really love his natural fit in this offense. I just don't think that he's the type of guy that demands number one attention, right? I, I don't think right. he's in that tier, but I think that he's a really nice piece in their system because of his versatility, because of his speed, because of his ball carrying ability too. He's pretty good after the catching with the ball in his hands. I could see them using him as a chess piece, you know, somebody that you don't, you can get matchups for. You don't exactly know where he's going to line up on every single play. So I really like the fit. Just hope that that wouldn't be the only move. The other name I wanted to bring up was uh, Zach Ertz, who 
I put out there that I would actually be pretty interested in Zach Ertz, even at for, in a trade, uh, which is a $8.25 million cap hit if you acquire him via trade. A lot of people said that that's a way too much money for Zach Ertz. I don't think that's way too much money. This is not the NFL five years ago, right? This The salary cap is getting crazy. Uh, guys like Hunter Henry, he's going to be probably close to 12. Johnny Smith is probably going to be close to 10. Gerald Everett from the Rams is probably going to be six, seven million, somewhere in that range. 2019, Zach Ertz had 90 catches, right? That, that's right. more production than the Patriots have had at tight end in the last three years, probably combined. Now, he wasn't the same player last year. He looked slow out there. He had injuries down the stretch that really hampered him. He struggled in, to, in 2020, but I still think that that is the type of risk. And again, I'm not sure if Zach Ertz hits the open market and the Patriots are just coming in with some market level deal that he's picking the Patriots over some of the other options that he could go to. And that's why a trade for him really interests me because that gets you the player automatically, right? You don't have to deal right. with outbidding other teams. You don't have to deal with the fact that maybe the Packers or the Chiefs or somebody is going after him that has a contender at quarterback and, and they're going to be Super Bowl favorites or something like that. Ertz is the exact type of like player that I kind of see as – okay, we can bring this guy in. We still have Devin Asiasi. We still have Dalton Keene, although I, I think that's a different category. We still have Devin Asiasi. Zach Ertz can come in here and play the position for a year or two, help us develop those young guys, give us some respectability, a veteran presence in the tight end room that's not somebody like a Ryan Izzo or a Matt Lacoste. I think that that's a decent move. The Patriots want to go there. And I still, I have no problems with the $8.25 million tag uh, in terms of his cap number. When you have sixty-seven million dollars in cap space, right. eight point two five million is a kick in the bucket. Like, let's not sit here and worry about every nickel and dime when you're a team with almost seventy million in cap space. And then I'll just kind of to continue your line of thinking because it's the eight million cap. Actually, I think it's less than eight. Oh no, I'm looking at the wrong column. Yeah, it's it's uh, eight point two five million to acquire him in a trade. Twelve million dollar cap hit though, but still, I would I would pay that. So you have the $12 million cap hit, and then you have a couple dead years at the end. But, like, hypothetically, what do you think it costs to get Ertz, like, in, in a trade? In a trade? I don't think much because that is pricey for the player that played in 2020. If, if I say a third-round pick, can we agree I that that's – I think they could probably flip one of their fourth-round comp picks for Zach Ertz at this point. So I'll even say – let's go hypothetically with a third just to play it yeah. safe. If you had said third was fine, I might have pushed a second. But yeah, um, let's say a third, you bring Zach Ertz in for a year. You, you get a starting caliber tight end, which you haven't had in two years. Right. He walks, minimal dead money. You get the third round pick you traded back because you're probably going to get a comp pick for him, assuming he performs decently well, which he should. And you buy another year for Ossie, Ossie, and Keen to develop. That to right. me all around, that's a win, 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 win everywhere. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's kind of what I'm looking at. The only, like, again, does, and does he perform well enough to earn you a third round comp pick? People are talking about him like, oh, he's so old. He's 31. Yeah, the same people who are getting mad at everybody for calling Cam old are the ones calling Ertz old, and they're the same age. Well, he looked I, old. He played old last year. Not that Cam didn't necessarily play old last year. No, it it, it happens. Ertz didn't run very well last year, and I think that's a big reason why people are concerned that maybe he, his best days are behind him. But the Patriots don't need his best days, right? They just need right. a competent NFL tight end. And I think that he is one of those guys, too, that when he's at his best, his quickness at the top of the route is really difficult to cover in the middle of the field. If you're going to drop linebackers into underneath zones, if you're going to try to cover him with the safety, when, he, when he's at his absolute best, and we saw this in the Super Bowl in 2017 – he can be really difficult to cover at the top of the route. And that's something that I think that they don't necessarily have is that big body guy that can really win at with separation at the top and then body control and frame and using that to box guys out and stuff like that in the middle of the field. I think he's a nice fit in terms of what they do with their passing game. And ultimately, like we keep on saying, they don't need they don't need prime Gronk to walk through the door. That would be great if they can find that sure. player. But they don't necessarily need that, right? They just need somebody that can be a respectable NFL veteran at that position. Even last year, Zach Ertz was better than anything they rolled out there at tight end, even in his diminished state. So I believe he had better numbers than all three Patriots tight ends combined. I th I'll check that. I think he did. They're 30. 30 
Yeah. 36 guys who did. I think he was one of them. The year before, he had 90 catches, almost 1,000 yards, and six touchdowns. You know, that's nothing to sniff, sniff about. You can easily get him back to that level or close to that level, potentially. I just feel like those are the types of risks that the Patriots need to take. Because- yeah, Ertz, Ertz single-handedly put up about the same numbers as Izzo, Asi, Asi, Key and Keen combined last year. I think those are the types of risks you need to take when you're a team with 70 million in space that isn't the most attractive free agent destination right now. That isn't number one on, on everybody's list of places that they want to go. That doesn't have Tom Brady on the roster anymore. You need to figure out some unique ways to address things. And I, I think Johnny Smith is a better player than Zach Ertz at this stage, but he's also going to make more money than him. He's also going to have a lot more suitors at the, you know lining up to sign him in free agency. And that's even if he hits free agency, because I still think there's a chance that the Titans might place the tag on him because the tight end tag is really reasonable. It's not a tag like a quarterback or a wide receiver where you're paying a guy, you know, a big allocation of your cap. I think it's somewhere around 10, $11 million for next year for the tight end tag. So that's not terrible. I just feel like we are harping on that 8.25 million number like the Patriots are a team that has no cap space. So I, I I would I'm just curious what you think cuz Ger- you mentioned Gerald Everett before and he's a guy I was, I've always liked and he's slated to be a free agent. Where would you put him in this conversation with Smith and Ertz and, and like where would you rank him? So I think the issue with Gerald Everett is that I think he's a competent tight end. I think he's a nice piece but it's even at his best, is he somebody that teams have to game plan for? Is he somebody that you have to? Have I mean, is Johnu Smith for? somebody teams have to game plan for? I, I think. Say the, so. I think. I think because of his versatility, he is right. Because you're going to okay. line him up in different places, you're going to move him around the formation, and you have to sort of be able to identify where he's at and have a, the right type of cover guy to cover him given the situation, right? I think with a guy like Ertz, if he gets back to closer to 2019 form, the teams are going to look at that and say, hey, we're going to have to put a really good coverage safety on this guy. Or we might even have to put a corner on it if we don't have a Patrick Chung or we don't have a a Kyle Duggar on our roster, right? We might have to put a really uh, one of our like low end corners on him, uh, possibly. I don't think that you move that needle in other ways with with a guy like a Gerald Everett. Everett, Okay. I think that he's more of of a guy that's, that's, certainly more well-rounded certainly has more going for him than Brian is or in that level of right. tight end, but isn't necessarily a game plan piece. Now and, let's say so. they go out and they add Samuel. Um, I'm just trying to think like Corey Davis pick a third, like a, a you know, seven to $10 million wide receiver. Like then does Gerald Everett become more realistic to you? Or do you yeah. still, do yeah. you think they can get by with Gerald Everett as a tight end one, if they add enough at wide receiver or do they still need even if they add all those guys, a Johnny Smith or a Zach Ertz. No, I think that they could get it done with Gerald Everett if they added a wide receiver because you can funnel the ball to different places, right? Right. And, and that's something that I think that we definitely should focus on too is that the offense doesn't need to funnel through the same play, the same types of playmakers as it has in the past. It well, that does that that for that to happen though, they have to be willing to change up the offense, which they haven't done. A little bit, but they, so I throw that caveat on there. Right. But my point is, is they don't need to be a tight end slot receiver, heavy offense. If they are able to acquire players that win in other ways, that isn't necessarily in the middle of the field or isn't necessarily out of the slot, th- then they can win in those ways. And, and I think that they should adjust the offense in that case to to their personnel. And I'm sure that they would. Let's just let's talk about Adam Humphreys because this yeah. is a name that was not on my radar to be honest with you. But there's a lot of rumors. He's got almost a ten million dollar cap hit in Tennessee. It's a nine point five million actually. He does have carry some dead money, so it's not free for them to cut him. But it's not a ton. They're still going to save money against the cap by releasing him. He is probably looking like he's going to be a cap casualty in Tennessee. And we know how much they loved him in the free agency a few years ago. The Patriots wanted Adam Humphreys. And there were some disappointed people in the organization, certainly that they did not get Adam Humphreys. They tried to up their offer at the last minute. It wasn't enough to pry him out of Tennessee and change his mind. Do they get their guy the second time around if he becomes free again? I think that this is a really interesting move because of Julian Edelman's situation. This could really uh, be a good a good move for the Patriots. So I mean, like we've talked about with a number of guys, I don't know that I take on the contract. I think if he gets cut, he's certainly worth looking at and a guy they should bring in. But you know, you're going to have other guys. You know, I look at Jameson Crowder right from the Jets, who's probably going to get cut. Yeah, he's another one. Like, are, do you want to pay? And I get there's a talent gap. But it's 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 you know asset management. Do you want to pay Jamison Crowder? Or do you want to pay Jamison Crowder 
just what you what you want to pay him and sign him or do you want to trade for adam humphrey have to give up capital and then have that massive dead cap hit i know i'm going against the whole aggressive thing at the beginning i guess this is where i'm kind of more fine when you get down to that third wide receiver with them nickel and diming like i'd like to see them get Humphreys, but he's not going to excite me until he gets cut. I'm just with that contract, I'm not going to be interested in it. Yeah. So they're the team acquiring him in a trade would only have to pay about six point seven million dollars against the cap in terms oh, of the dead caps for the Titans. Yeah, the dead cap would be okay. the Titans if they released him and, and made him a free agent. I what I've always felt with Adam Humphreys, and I was actually surprised that they wanted to give him as much money as they did a few years ago, because I always looked at him as more Danny Amendola than Julian Edelman. You know, a guy that's a nice complimentary receiver, but was he ever going to be somebody that could carry an offense through a playoff run like Julian Edelman has in the past or something like that? I don't necessarily know, but he certainly has that shiftiness, that inside ability, route running ability, the option routes, the whip routes, you know, stuff like that is it's right in his wheelhouse. So you see the fit in that slot receiver role for the Patriots. I just don't necessarily know if I saw it as much as they did to offer him. They, they offered him close to $11 million as their final offer. I right. always saw him as more of like a Danny Amendola. I guess relative to the year, maybe Danny Amendola's contract back in what was that 2012, 2013 that they signed him in free agency. Yep. That might have been if you kind of prorate it for this, you know, going six years in advance, maybe it was closer than I thought, but it was a big contract that they were willing to offer Adam Humphreys. It hasn't worked out the way that they were hoping in Tennessee for him. Certainly Corey Davis and AJ Brown's emergence had a factor in that as well. Injuries had a factor in it too. I think that this is an, uh, we're talking a lot about kind of putting two guys together instead of paying all, all of it to one guy. If right. they can get that one, that number one guy, and they're bringing in Adam Humphreys as sort of the number two complimentary guy, sort of what the Bills did with Diggs and Cole Beasley, for example, then maybe I can be talked into it a little bit more. I'm just, and I mean, I'm just realizing this. Like, we're talking about Mariota, Smith, Corey, uh, John Smith, Corey Davis, Adam Humphrey. Like, do you just want to be – the Patriots have always done their own thing. They've never been one of these teams that just sucks players off other teams, right? Remember, we had the Detroit Patriots and all yeah. the guys going there down in Houston. That was th like the Patriots were always the team that guys were, were were snatching players from. They were never one of these teams that just, you know, moved up, like take another roster and push it somewhere else. Sure. All of a sudden, we're talking about the New England Titans. <laughs> like that's and I'm not saying that they're going yeah. to go out and get all of these guys we're talking about. But and this just kind of hit me. But, you know. If you're bringing in Mariota and then you sign John U. Smith and then you trade for Adam Humphrey, we, we've seen that. We've seen that before. So maybe the coaching is different. Although I, I think Vrabel's a heck of a coach, but I just, I, I don't know. I, I feel like they're, they're, there's, I don't even know how to describe it. It's just, why, they're all Titans. Maybe it's a coincidence. I don't know. I just, I'm noticing that pattern here. Program. You know, it's not the same exact coaching style, obviously, for able to Belichick, but what they do is similar. It's not it's not even the same system offensively. They run a West Coast system with well, with right. they did with Arthur Smith. I'm sure they're gonna continue to one run West Coast. They run a McVeigh Shanahan style offense, right? Under center, bootleg action, West Coast. And that's why Adam Humphreys didn't end up really fitting there. It's because there's not a great role for like a shifty slot receiver that's really the third guy in on the rotation. They play a lot of two two wide receiver sets in Tennessee because they're always under center. So they didn't really have a role for him the way they necessarily thought that they were going to. So I think that that's an interesting element of it too with him is that when he got there, they were sort of expecting to be a little bit more spread with Marcus Mariota, right? You're going to be a little right. bit more in shotgun, a little bit more of a spread offense. Then they sort of transitioned to Ryan Tannehill. Arthur Smith transitions the offense to more of like a Shanahan McVay wide zone scheme. And all of a sudden you go under center, you put your two big wide receivers on the outside and Corey Davis and AJ Brown, and it takes on a completely different life in that offense. So that's what sort of happened with Adam Humphreys. That's why it's kind of interesting that maybe he could kind of come here and get back into his more comfortable, more natural role for him. Cause in Tennessee, he became Danny Amendola. He became a third down passing situation type of player for when they did go shotgun. They put him in the game as that third wide receiver in the slot when he was healthy. 
that was that was it. That was really the only playing time that he got because you're not going to put a little five foot ten wide receiver out there when you're trying to be Derrick Henry, run the football down everybody's throats, right? It's, right. it's not the right guy for it. So that that's I think a, a big element of it too. I, I think the names that we talked about today, though, uh, for the most part, Wait, can, I, can I add one more? I don't know if we're yeah. up against it. Can I add no, one no. more? Go ahead. All right. So you tell me if this guy interests you. Uh, 6'2", 215, 4, 3, 40 guy, 27 years old. Is it Sammy Watkins? It's not Sammy Watkins. Who is it? Who's who's my favorite, perennial favorite free agent wide receiver? Every year I say the Patriots should, should sign this guy. You do? I don't know if we've been working together long enough for you to know this. Mark uh, Joe? No, Brashad Perryman. Brashad? Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Like, like Brashad Perryman, I love Brashad Perryman because yeah. he's just – He's that rare combination of size and speed. You sure. don't find a ton of guys like that. He was stuck early in his career, uh, you know, with some bad quarterback play. He got hurt quite a bit at the beginning, but he, he's coming together. Like, he's put together a couple full years. He was decent for, for Tampa in 2019. I'm not going to use his Jets 2020 numbers because that the, the quarterback play was off. Down the stretch, he really started to come into his own with Tampa Bay. So here's here's what I'm saying. If we're talking about the complimentary guys, they still need to go out and get 1A, right? They still yeah. need to go out and get – Whoever it is, Kenny Galladay, Juju, pick a name. But big speed on the outside that you use about 40, 45% of your routes that you just send down the field. Essentially a bigger, more physical, more polished Demir Bird. And yeah. he's going to cost nothing because he was on the Jets last year and the tape on him sucks. Like that's the guy. Like the I, tape I, I, on him sucks except against the Patriots. which is against the – which. A big element of this, right? I yes. mean, they always go for guys that kill them. I have always liked Brashad Perryman, and he's a guy that was really raw coming out, like raw, like more raw than Nikhil Harry, right? By the like, way, that, that Monday night game, five yeah. catches, 101 yards, two touchdowns, then in week 17, three for 84. Yeah, I mean, he had great games against the Patriots this year. He was always – he was a really raw guy coming out, but he always had that explosiveness, and he reminded me a ton of Cordero Patterson, right? Same body type. Okay, yep explosiveness same speed but Brashad Perriman's been able to develop his game a little bit more at a at the wide receiver positions to kind of be a respectable NFL wide out I love the idea of that at, at X to kind of upgrade that position but we're not necessarily talking about the huge upgrades but we're talking about a little bit of upgrades here a little bit of upgrades there and and PFF I thought published a really interesting article the other day I'm sorry I forget who wrote it but they published an article about secondary wide receivers, not the top guy, but the, the right. number two and number three receiver and how important that guy can be in the pecking order. And sort of the, the guy, the poster child for the article was Cole Beasley, right? Because you okay. have Ron Diggs, who's the man in Buffalo, obviously. But then you have a guy in Cole Beasley, who is a really, really high end number two receiver for them last year. And you saw how much that impacted the offense to, okay, teams are going to double digs or they're going to rotate the coverage over towards digs or the Patriots are going to put JC Jackson or Stefan Gilmore on Stefan Diggs, And then Cole Beasley is going to be left playing the second corner or the slot corner or whatever. And they were able to be productive there in that spot. So why we're talking so much about these guys is because these guys do move the needle for the Patriots, right? You bring in Brashad Perryman and you bring in Curtis Samuel. Yeah, it's not the big names. It's not Allen Robinson. It's not Odell Beckham. It's not Julio Jones necessarily. But two of those guys together can be really effective for an offense because it does become more difficult to cover all of those options. If you have five guys out in the pattern, abstract thought, have five guys out in the pattern that can actually affect the defense. Right. right? The Patriots haven't had that in three years. So if you can get to that point, then even if you don't have uh, this star wide out, even if you don't have, even if you don't have the Julio, you can, you're going to be a much better offense than you were a year ago. And even if you do, and I feel free to disagree with me on this. This is just kind of how I've always felt. You know, I, we're talking, we're talking about the second and third guy. We're not talking about the first guy, which they do still need to get. They don't have, yeah. I'm not saying bring in Brashad Perryman and you're fixed. I'm saying right. bring him in after you've signed you know, Juju's the name. I, I He's at the top of my head. I, maybe that's the guy or not. But here's my point. Those those guys, right? The guys who are going to go on the first day of free agency, the guys who are going to go during the tampering period, they're going to be good wherever they go. Those guys, I don't think, are hard to sign because you know they're good. You just throw money at them. The scheme isn't as important. They're talented. Yeah. They're going to find a way to produce. The secondary guys, they're a little less talented. So this, you need to find guys who are more of a scheme fit. Like you mentioned with Humphreys, it kind of went ass up. More, can I throw one more name out there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and this is a better wide receiver. This is probably a, like a number one guy. Albert Breer threw out Michael Thomas the other day. And I mean, that would be fantastic. I don't know if Slam Boy is going to be available, but <laughs> they, I think the way he plays what they would like, I do not think they would like the sensitivity off the field no. on Twitter, no. social media and stuff like that. I don't think they would like that, but in terms of the way that he wins and he's not a vertical threat, but if you pair Michael Thomas with a Brashad Perryman and maybe you bring in a Curtis Samuel too, or something like that. And those are your guys then you can have some speed on the outside or speed in the middle of the field to help Michael Thomas get the coverage off of him in the short and intermediate area. And we know how productive a receiver that can run routes, option routes, slant routes, in breakers, things like that, like Michael Thomas can, could potentially be in this offense if they surround him with some guys that can get that coverage off of him. So, yeah, and I agree. So I guess what I was saying is, again, if you bring in Michael Thomas, like that's a no-brainer, right? You're bringing in Michael Thomas, like duh. So, but but when you get down, th- those first guys, you throw mat- money at them, they're going to come, they're going to succeed. When you get down to that next level, you need guys who are more scheme fits. The yeah. negotiations might get a little trickier. They're valued differently. because Guys may value money. They may value fit. They may value chance to win. And you need more than one of them. So, you know, we could talk about the first guy all we want, but that's, I don't think that's as much of a conversation. That's just preference. Like, like Juju or Kenny Galladay, who do you want? Do you want, uh, um, uh, in Tampa, Chris, I'm, I can't do names today. Chris Godwin, Michael Thomas. Right. Like, do you want Chris Godwin? Michael, like, we can just go and, right. and throw names back and forth, but it's these secondary guys, I think, where it gets a lot more interesting. So I just want to clarify you know, we're throwing out all these secondary names. It's not that we don't know they need to add a, a, a number one guy on top of that. Yeah. This is just the, this is the real conversation, right? Bill Belichick, 2003, Rodney Harrison from the Super Bowl DVD. It's not about collecting talent, it's about building a team. That's not to say you don't need talent. Right. Going out and getting Chris Godwin, that's collecting talent, which you can do. But it's 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 getting Brashad Perryman. It's getting Adam Humphrey. It's getting Corey Davis. That's the building the team part. That's what puts you ahead from, you know, a nine or 10 win. Maybe we win the division team to a 10 to 12 win. You have something here, team. Right. One to 10. I don't want to say it's easy. Like like in terms of roster, if you're ranking the players, how talented they are. One to 10 isn't easy but it's relatively black and white. It's that 15 to 35 range that really sets teams apart. And it's much harder to consistently be good there. That's where the Patriots have always been great. Now, granted, they've always been Tom Brady at the top. So it it changes things, but they've always been that team that finds that Brashad Perryman, that finds that Adam Humphreys, that finds that player. That was Hogan. That was Amendola. It was, you know, on the defensive side, Jabal Sheard, um, like those guys. In other places, they're rotational players, right? They're they're right. part-time players. Here, they're like super role players, right? They're they're they're, they're super subs or super role players. They're guys that come in and fill a need and, and can play the position exactly how they want to hold that position down. Uh, we've talked a lot of we've thrown a lot of names. This is where we're going to continue to do. I'm sure for the rest of the month until free agency actually begins. This pod started with us kind of lamenting about the fact that Cam Newton is sort of the most obvious quarterback candidate for the Patriots to bring back at this point. But I think some of these names in the past catchers, and like we've been mentioning, we get that they're not Julio. We get that it's not these big time uh, pass catchers, top five players in the league, but I think the Patriots would be much, much better off if they sign one of these guys. So Alex and I will be back on the podcast, though, on Thursday for our live Q&A. We'll be back on the pod next week on Tuesday for uh, this version of the pod. But definitely come and join us if you're listening to this if you lasted the full hour, uh, come and join <laughs> us on the Q and a where we'll answer all your questions. If you, we didn't talk about a receiver today that you think would, might interest the Patriots that maybe you like T Y Hilton or Marvin Jones, for example, I think those players are a little bit older than what I would want the Patriots to go for, but maybe that's your cup of tea. We can definitely break those guys down and then break down some more of the quarterback options, but until then signing off for Alex Barth, I'm Evan Lazar. Thanks for listening. 